So it's just you and me here, Lauren. Shane's away. Shane is away, shaping young minds. He's off teaching grad students how to catch frogs, kill frogs. It's ecology. We're not sure, but we are taking over the podcast. It's it's Nancy and Lauren here taking over the podcast. And it is summer here in D.C. And it is hot as anything. Yes, it's like a swamp. And that kind of brings me back to last summer. What happened last summer? The eclipse. How could I possibly forget about the eclipse? It was amazing. I actually was, um, well, Lauren, you were here in D.C. So you saw like um, 70, what was it? It was about 90% totality. Um, yeah, I though happened to be in Colorado for vacation and got to go up to Wyoming and see totality, which, which, you know, was quite the experience. I bet. How was it? It was amazing. And like, you know, remember I, I wasn't that into it in the beginning and then I saw it and I was like moved to almost crying to tears. Yeah. Wow. Pretty amazing. So it took us 14 hours to get back to Colorado from Wyoming, but that's a whole nother story. 14 hours in the car. Yeah. But totally worth it. Wow. Totally worth it. Anyway, but that brings us to to talk about, you know, it's such an amazing experience. The only way to kind of talk about it is what you're seeing, you know, just that it's so incredible. What it looks like. Yeah. And it, it brings up that interesting question. You know, if you are blind, visually impaired, and how do you describe it to someone who can't see? I don't know. Um, and that's kind of the topic of our podcast this week. Welcome to the American Geophysical Union's podcast about the scientists and methods behind the science. These are the stories you won't read in a manuscript or hear in a lecture. I'm Nancy Bompi. And I'm Lauren LaPuma. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. The eclipse brings up this interesting question. So much of space science and planetary science is so visual. You know, we have these amazing images of planets and stars being born and stars dying that I can't imagine what it's like. How do you share that with someone who can't see? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And that's something actually that this scientist that I met at one of um, our AGU meetings is trying to answer and trying to help blind and visually impaired people to experience space science. My name is Dr. Henry de Greffen Reed Winter III, but nobody calls me that (laughs) ever, as much as sometimes I'd like for them to call me doctor. Um, Everybody calls me Trey. And that's because I'm the third, and I live in the I lived in the South for most of my life, where nicknames are a thing. Uh, I'm an astrophysicist at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So Trey's a scientist. How does he go about sharing science with people who can't see or who are visually impaired? Yeah, that's a good question. So he started out, you know, as a scientist studying the sun, um, but got really interested in designing museum exhibits. Um, for blind and visually impaired people. Um, And one of the coolest things he's done is design an app for the eclipse last year for people who are blind and visually impaired. So how did he get into doing this? I was working with a museum and they had an exhibit at the museum that was labeled an accessible exhibit, right? It was accessible for people who are blind and visually impaired. I was going, oh, that's great. That's really cool. I want to I uh, check out what this is about. So I went to check it out, and it was, a, it was a death mask. It was very ornate. It was bejeweled and painted and beautiful and under glass because it was thousands of years old, so you, know, you couldn't touch it. And the accessibility part was they had a label on the side that gave the name of the mask and the date that it was probably made and in Braille, and that was it, all right? And I just sat there and I was like outraged it's like that's not accessible there's no experience of that mask by knowing when it was built and what its name was you you're completely missing the point how can you call this an accessible exhibit I realized that you know my uh, exhibits and not only my exhibits but astronomy and astrophysics as a whole really is inaccessible to people who are blind and visually impaired and yeah I just didn't like that so Trey's a scientist, and he got really angry by this, you know, lack of accessible museum exhibits. So how did he go about designing things for people who are blind and visually impaired? Well, he had to really learn a lot about, you know, he he, he said he, he started really with no um, expertise in that area. So he had to first go to the community, you know, people who are blind and visually impaired, and learn about how they experience the world. I started working with 3D prints a little bit um, and was I'm going to take that a little bit farther in the coming years. But I started um, working with uh, the National Federation of the Blind, going to some of their uh, symposia on uh, tactile graphics, uh, because I didn't know what I was doing in this space. The first thing that you have to do is 
you know, learn about the community that you're trying to serve. And as part of that, I made a bunch of great friends. Uh, one of their, uh, one of them's uh, Chansey Fleet. She is the Accessible Technology Coordinator at the New York Public Library. I met her, we talked about some ideas, and I had scheduled a trip to visit her in 2017 at her library to kind of learn about what was available and what was there. And at the same time, I got pulled into doing a bunch of eclipse outreach work. There was a total solar eclipse on August 21st of 2017. Uh, it was the first total solar eclipse to go from one edge of the country to the other and forever. And um, it was a huge deal. NASA really wanted to play it up. And they had, NASA had created this Braille book about the eclipse. And as we were sitting there, you know, um, exploring the book, I first, you know, put it out there and said, you know, I don't want to tell you anything about it. Just explore it on your own and tell me what you get from it. And the book was well made. I, I don't mean to be dissing the book, but there were so many points of misinformation uh, that could have been that was picked up on the book. And so, after we kind of explored that book and I took some notes, she asked me, "Well, what's an eclipse like?" And I hadn't seen one in person, but I, you know, been trained to talk about it. But I found that I had like no way to talk about it. Mm -hmm to somebody that had never seen before, right? Because it's like the day becomes night. Well, what does that mean? And um, a good friend of mine had told me a story about when he was in a field in the middle of nowhere and saw his first eclipse when the sky turned, you know, night dark, pretty much. Uh, all of a sudden, the fields came alive with the sound of crickets, right? They just all started chirping at once. Mammals like you and I, we have this circadian rhythm Right, and so we're not as vulnerable to just a quick shift in day and night. But crickets don't have that, and small insects don't have that. They just respond to changes of light and dark. And so they all came out all at once and started chirping away, looking for a date that night. Right? <laughs> um, and then when the the first rays of the sun started to appear across the moon and the eclipse was you know, starting to be over, they all switched off immediately, and it was just this amazing thing for them. And that's a story I could relate to her. And that just got me thinking, how can we have these relatable stories to uh, people who uh, have other ways of learning, people who are not visual learners for any reason, um, including being blind and visually impaired? And how can we communicate not only information, but the excitement and um, the awe of these um, images of in this case, the eclipse, but for me, astronomy and astrophysics in general, mm -hmm. to people who can't see. And that kind of got me started on uh, this, this whole uh, project and this direction that my career seems to be taking now. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about what you created for the eclipse. Right, so I visited Chansey in uh, February of 2017, and the eclipse was in August, and I decided, oh, okay, I've got to do something. What can I do? And that's what uh, started the Eclipse Soundscapes project. So the Eclipse Soundscapes project uh, originally started as an idea to try to record sounds during the eclipse, like crickets, like bird song, you know, all these different things, and uh, be able to um, you know, collect all of these recordings and give them to people who are blind and visually impaired so that they can have this experience with the eclipse. I convinced NASA that uh, it was a thing to do, that we would do it um, via mobile devices. Uh, because most people are blind and visually impaired, interact with the world uh, via mobile devices. It's been a game changer as far as them being able to be independent and engage with the world around them. So we were going to do this, and it turned out that there was no way to actually get live recordings to people on the day of the eclipse. Mm -hmm. And for me and my team, it was really important that we give people who are blind and visually impaired an experience at the time of the eclipse, when everybody else was experiencing uh, the eclipse. And we really very strongly wanted to foster two-way communications during the eclipse. So what we did was we collected all these images of different stages of the eclipse from eclipses past. Mm -hmm. And then we added a sonification layer to them. So what does that mean? It means that all images are are... Uh, there's spatial information that we've encoded with color. That's all an image is. So we've taken that same spatial information instead of encoding it with color, 
We've encoded it with sound. Right? And the way we did this was through a method called FM synthesis, frequency modulated synthesis. And what that does is it takes a series of tones, merges them together to create a variety of different tones. So you're actually getting all these superimposed tones at once. It has a science fiction feel. And one of the reasons why we did that was we wanted there to be a very physical response as people took these images of different stages of the eclipse and then explored it via touch. Uh, we didn't want them to just hear it. We wanted them to be able to feel it. Mm -hmm. How do you have them feel it on the mobile device? Mm -hmm. And that's to actually shake the uh, mobile device. Almost all mobile devices have haptic motors in them, little motors that make it move or vibrate mm -hmm. when you put it on mm -hmm. silent and mm -hmm. you get a phone call. Uh, but early on, we found out that Apple wasn't going to let us have access to those haptic motors, even for an accessibility project, uh, because, as they stated, it uh, drains the battery too fast. So, challenge. So how do you do this? <laughs> so how do you design around it? How do you use mm -hmm. it? And then FM synthesis turned out to be uh, the uh, perfect tool. What we do is we have so many different frequencies of sound, so many different vibrations that if you turn up the speakers loud enough, just like when you've got that heavy bass at a rock concert that shakes your uh, rib cage, right, when you're too close to the stage, that's what we were trying to achieve on the pad, have the speakers actually uh, shake the pad a little bit. And we called this you know, process the rumble map, right? We encoded uh, the variations of light and dark uh, in an eclipse so that you could hear it, but also it would rumble your device in your hands, and there would be this sensation that you were actually touching the sun. So I actually downloaded the app on my phone. Now. Oh, sweet. Let's hear it. Let's play with it. You want to play with it? Yeah. Okay. So Go. I'm opening it up. I'm going to the rumble map. So I'm going to try to put this as close to the mic as I can. So here I'm looking at a picture of helmets streamers which is kind of uh, when this, when it's in totality and you can see parts of the corona, I think, extending out from the sun. So I'm gonna put my finger on it. Whoa. And you can feel it too. Yeah, it's vibrating. I can feel it against my finger. That is so cool. I love the app. <laughs> People who are blind or visually impaired, what was their reaction to using this app on the day of the eclipse? Our Facebook page got so much love that I can't even it, it makes me tear up sometimes when I read some of these messages um, there's this one person that um, sent me a personal message and I put it on my talks and I tear up every time I talk about it and it's about how she never thought that she'd be able to experience um, a sunrise let alone an eclipse and um, it, this app for her was a unique experience and something that she thought spoke to what you can do if you think about things, if you design for everybody in mind, and you don't have this bias that some experiences are for some people and not for others. All over the country and a couple of places around the world have uh, sent us emails about using the apps in their classroom. Uh, I've know, I know a couple of special education teachers that are actually using it uh, to teach um, their classes some lessons about not only the eclipse, but also memory and different ways of experiencing the world. Are there other communities that you think could be served, not only by what you're doing, but also like that need to be served, mm -hmm. that aren't being served at all? I talk about non-traditional learners mm -hmm. a lot because that um, really encompasses a lot of um, people. That some need different accommodations, some just have different ways of learning. What we've found is that this kind of um, kinesthetic learning isn't just a way for people who are blind and visually impaired to have uh, access to information, but it is a way for um, people with, who are neuroatypical learners can also engage in a different way. And the reason why is that the more pathways you give the brain to accept information, the deeper the learning is. So I think this kind of multimodal approach uh, really helps everybody. Um, you know, people who are sighted love the app because it is a new way to experience information and anything that's new is kind of exciting, right? And so if you're a visual learner or if you're a kinesthetic learner or if you're an, uh, you learn better via audio, 
you know, having all of those available to you at once can really help uh, quite a bit. So the eclipse was a year ago, but the app was just the beginning for Trey. I mean, he's doing all sorts of things to help blind and visually impaired people experience uh, space science. What I'd like to do is work more on museum exhibits because there's a real drive for accessibility there. Museums and uh, informal learning places, public learning spaces really want to be inclusive. That is one of their core missions. So my hope is that we can build these themes for the museum spaces and then come up with some best practices, some pipelines, some software that we can give out freely to everybody so that you don't have to recreate that wheel every single time you're a scientific author, you know, you're a scientist and you want to put a graphic in your paper. You don't have to spend the six months I did trying to figure out how to encode mm. this information. You can press a big red button, right? And then that information will be translated into a variety of modes for a variety of uh, non-traditional learners. Yeah. I mean, I, w one question I have for you, though, about developing this app, too, is, I mean, you came from a traditional kind of, I guess, sci science background. Mm -hmm. I mean, is the, personally for you, what's it like to kind of go into this different area and, you know, help like a community that, you know, has been not been able to, you know, access this, this information? So for me, I mean, my dream was to always be a scientist, an astrophysicist. And when I was growing up, I was grew up in a very, fairly poor rural area. And I just didn't think that this was for me and um, worked hard, didn't think working hard was enough. And yet I got here and it meant so much to me. Uh, being, there's nothing that compares to me to like seeing different views of the sun, the universe, potentially being the first person to ever see that, right? It, I cannot express adequately how much that meant to me. And to think that some people are very much excluded from that is just kind of abhorrent to me. Um, so it is a bit of a change, but I guess it's a change that I'm really enjoying making. Uh, I've done my research work. I've done the research papers, which are extremely important, advanced the knowledge of the sun a little bit that maybe 30 or 40 people read, right? <laughs> and then, you know, they do the next papers and they do the next papers. This kind of engagement work... Uh, you do get to re reach out to a larger uh, population of people and people who are very appreciative to have somebody or to have a team. I should never say somebody. To have teams of people working to um, you know, make this information accessible for everyone. So, you know, there have been people who say, oh, well, you're not really an astrophysicist anymore. It's like, well, I kind of am and I'm not. I mean, the whole point of being a scientist is that there are things that you don't know how to do, and then you figure out how to do them. And that takes, you know, imagination, it takes creativity, it takes a lot of hard work, it takes research, and it always takes building a team. You, know, you will never know everything you need to know to solve hardly any problem. The image of a scientist working alone in a room with just, you know, a blackboard and equations is actually not right. You have to work with several other people and their blackboards uh, in order to come to a common answer. So I think that the skills of being a scientist have actually perfectly trained me to do this kind of work because you know, I know how to ask a question, I know how to form a hypothesis, I know how to uh, realize, oh, okay, I failed, so it's time to go back to that drawing board and, and do it again. Uh, and I know how to ask for help w uh, for people that have specialized knowledge that I don't have. And I think all of those are key. So, Nancy, are you going to be an eclipse chaser now? Are you going to go to the next one in 2024? Yeah, I mean, when you see one, you're kind of like totally hooked. And as one astrophysicist told me, 90% is nothing. Totality or bust. Yes, you have to go see one, Lauren. I'm ready. I'm planning for 2024. Nice. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everyone. That's all from Third Pod from the Sun. Thanks to Trey for sharing his work with us. This podcast was produced with help from Shane Hanlon, Josh Spizer, Olivia Ambrosio, and Liza Lester. And thank you to Adele Coleman for producing this episode. AGU would love to hear your thoughts on this podcast. Please rate and review us. And of course, you can always find new episodes on your favorite podcasting app or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Maybe Shane will come back or maybe we'll take over. <laughs>